Hello, good afternoon, and happy International Day of Democracy. This is not a Hallmark holiday, uh, so you won't find a card, but it's an incredibly important way for us to all get together and have this conversation. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Forum on Human Rights and this afternoon's roundtable on maintaining democracy and human rights as pillars of US foreign policy. My name is Paige Alexander. I am the new CEO of the Carter Center, and I'm pleased to be moderating this online event organized in collaboration with the George W. Bush Institute as a celebration of International Day of Democracy. This actually gives us a really good opportunity to reflect on the state of democracy around the world and our in our place in that landscape. Much has been stated about the bleak democratic landscape that we're looking at. And to give a brief snapshot, in 2020's Freedom House Freedom of the World Report, it noted that 2019 was the 14th year of democratic decline globally. More than half of the countries in the world that were rated free or not free in 2009 have suffered a net decline in the last 10 years. Many experts agree that we're in the midst of a global democratic recession. And around the world, we see an increased infringement on the civil and political rights of individuals and the closure of civic space and civil society organizations suffering. Under the global pandemic with COVID, we're seeing that additional assertions have been made and this is causing added problems. So a wave of authoritarian populism is sweeping over various parts of the world and the commitment to democracy appears to be wavering even in the long established democracies that many of us have worked in. And so for many decades now, the, US state form, uh, the US, United States foreign policy has supported democracy and human rights. In 1977, President Carter prioritized human rights as a key US foreign policy goal for his administration. He established the Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor as the conscience of the State Department back in the day. So as President Carter said in 1978, when commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights is the soul of our foreign policy because human rights is the very soul of our sense of nationhood. So President Ronald Reagan continued this emphasis on human rights, lending US support to a global democratic revolution and worked with the bipartisan support in Congress to create the National Endowment for Democracy which supports the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, many of us know as NDI, and the International Republican Institute for International Affairs, or IRI. Since the early years of this, their work, IRI and NDI have worked alongside the Carter Center in support of democracy and human rights. So we're thrilled to have Dan joining us today as well. So through the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, democracy and human rights has remained a focus for US foreign policy through direct government action, but also through the soft power of assistance funding and projects. Although US foreign policy or US policy itself wasn't always consistent in prioritizing democracy and human rights, it has always remained a vital foreign policy goal. So over the last 10 to 15 years, the state of democracy globally has slowed and even begun to reverse. The number of authoritarian and populist regimes has grown while the number of countries that are democracies has declined. In parallel, there have been increasing debates in the US about the role of our country should be playing in advancing democracy and human rights globally. So it was in this context in January of 2020 that the George W. Bush Institute published a report entitled, Choose Freedom, Revitalizing American Support for Democracy and Human Rights in the 21st Century. In essence, the report is essentially a call to action to a range of actors to think about how the United States can re-engage on issues relevant to democracy and human rights internationally. And it's this call to action that we use as our starting point for today's discussion. So let me get started. We're lucky to have with us today the author of that report, Nicole Bibin Sadaka. Nicole is the Kelly and David File Fellow at the George W. Bush Institute, bringing her expertise in American foreign policy, democracy, freedom, human rights, and leadership. Nicole is, writes and speaks on behalf of the George W. Bush Institute. She also serves as a faculty in the various leadership programs in Georgetown University's Masters of Science and Foreign Service program. She's the deputy director and chair for the Global Politics and Security Concentration, as well as a professor in practice of international affairs. She teaches graduate seminars in democracy, human rights, ethics, and decision-making. She also is part of the democracy bureaucracy at the State Department for 10 years. So welcome, Nicole. Thank welcome you, it's wonderful to be here. Great. Uh, thanks. And we're also very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Jennifer McCoy. 
Jennifer is a professor of uh, political science at Georgia State University. Her current research pro project is on polarized politics, quite timely, and it aims to identify the causes and consequences and solutions to polarized societies around the world, including in the US. She has coined the term pernicious polarization to refer to the political polarization that divides societies into mutually distrustful us versus them camps and undermines the capacity of democracies to address critical policy problems. Jennifer, as we were joking, has served as the director of the Carter Center's Americas program from 98 to 2015, leading projects on democratic strengthening, mediation and dialogue and hemispheric cooperation. Jennifer has now spent much longer at the Carter Center than I have, so welcome Jennifer. Thank you, pleased to be here too. Great, so I think we're still missing uh, Dr. LeVar Smith, so I will come back when he's able to get through the technical difficulties here. But the, uh, I also want to welcome, in, uh, welcome, welcome Dan Twining, president of IRI. So Dan joined IRI as president in September 2017, and he leads the Institute's mission to advance democracy, freedom around the world. He heads IRI's team of over 700 global experts to link people in governments, motivate people to engage in the political process, and guide politicians and government officials to be responsive to citizens. Previously, Dan worked as counselor and director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, based in DC. And he served as the executive management team that governs GMF's annual operations. As director of the Asia program, he led a team working on the rise of Asia and its implications in the West. Prior to GMF, Dan served as a member of the policy planning staff at the State Department, as a foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain, and as a staff member to the U.S. Trade Representative. He too has taught at Georgetown University and served as a military instructor with the Naval Postgraduate School. So welcome, Dan. Thanks, Paige. It's great to be with you. Great to have you here. So for the audience, before I kick off the conversation with Nicole, I want to note for the audience that we hope that you will participate and join in. You can do so at any time by joining the live chat and submitting questions to the panelists. And don't feel that you have to wait until the end. In order to participate, I would say that you must be a member of the Forum on Human Rights. You can easily join by clicking into that chat box on the right of this video feed or by clicking on the Join Community tab at the type the top right corner of your browser. So Nicole, let me handle, hand it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Paige. And thank you, um, thank you to the Carter Center, to you and to the Bush Institute for pulling together this conversation on an important day. It's not a hallmark holiday, but it certainly is a day for us to reflect on the importance of democracy, what it means at home and abroad. Let me just mention a few things about the report that we issued earlier this year. It seems like many, many years ago because the world has changed so much since January. What we saw um, was something which harkens back to what you began with, which is the United States since the 70s really on a bipartisan basis has um, had human rights and democracy as cornerstones of our foreign policy. And it was very much because it was reflective of American values and the values upon which our country was founded and not or um, not but, and it is um, consistent with Americans' interests. And I don't see values and interests to be two separate things. I see them as deeply intertwined. And um, our ability to support democracy activists, human rights activists around the world is both the right thing to do. And it is also deeply connected with our security interests by building and supporting stronger states around the world with stronger and more secure societies. And it's deeply consistent with our economic interests because our strongest trading partners, our strongest and most open markets are those where rule of law is respected, where, um, where there is a stable operating environment. And so for many, many years, democracy and human rights have been a cornerstone of our foreign policy. But what we've seen in the last several years is that has changed. The United States has stepped back from its role of um, advocating for, for uh, democracy and human rights around the world. And that not only impacts the people on the ground who are courageously fighting for these things, but also it impacts us. It impacts our security, it impacts our economic, and it impacts our values. And um, we wanted to come together to remind the American people that this is an essential part of our foreign policy and that we can't just look to Washington to be in charge of that. 
Um, Washington obviously plays a tremendously important role, both from the White House and from Congress and all the other um, members of the executive and legislative branch that are in Washington. But every part of American society, whether you are a governor or a mayor, whether you are a civil society leader, whether you're a faith leader, whether you are a business leader, you have a role to play in this, in moving your community, wherever you have a sphere of influence, into um, advocating for democracy, reminding that democracy is essential to the growth of American business and security, and also using your voice and your ballot to choose and advocate for, um, for stronger leadership on democracy and human rights at home and abroad. Great, uh, thank you. And, and the report, I think we can make sure it's also in the chat function, but those are all excellent points, Nicole. Uh, let me, you know, the way we're going to do this, I'm just gonna move around and ask our panelists some questions. So Dan, let me go to you. You recently testified in the House Committee on Foreign Affairs on authoritarianism, disinformation, and good government governance during COVID-19. You know, as I've noted, we, we really have seen an additional crackdown. So I'd be interested to hear from you how you've seen the global pandemic uh, unfold in your approach to democracy and human rights promotion during this time. Thanks, Paige. Great. It's such a pleasure to be with you, the Carter Center, the Bush Institute, and this distinguished group. You know, I think the fact that the Carter Center and the Bush Institute, named after a former Democratic and a former Republican president, uh, attest to the fact that democracy is an American value. It's not a partisan value in any way. Uh, so COVID, uh, we have seen autocrats use the virus uh, uh, to repress and suppress political opposition. Now, uh, this is ironic on many levels. The reason we are in a global pandemic is in part because of the nature of the Chinese governance model, where brave Chinese doctors and reporters wanted to warn the world about the pandemic in December and January. And instead of being allowed to do that, they were imprisoned or otherwise silenced. So the pandemic itself is not politically neutral. The pandemic emerged from an environment of autocracy in which the normal monitoring mechanisms did not work because the Chinese government saw a prestige value in not warning the world about the virus emanating from Wuhan. So uh, I would just like to make that point up front. Now, we have seen uh, successful democratic examples of managing COVID from Taiwan to New Zealand to Germany. Uh, so there's not an argument that somehow running a police state makes you more successful. It does mean you can lock your citizens down in a way that's frankly simply impossible in the United States, in Brazil, in India, the world's big democracies where the pandemic uh, has been uh, surging. Uh, but it's a reminder, I think the pandemic itself reminds us uh, that we want effective governing institutions that can do things like manage a public health crisis. We want free and open media reporting so that citizens can be informed about what is happening in ways that they simply were not in autocracies like China. Uh, we want all those functioning democratic institutions to muster a full spectrum response, uh, not just to the health crisis, but also to the economic crisis, right? That actually democratic institutions are part of how we come out of the pandemic and build uh, a world after it. That's a very good point. I think we're all suffering with this right now and trying to figure out exactly where it started and where it ends is uh, it's a good parlor game to have, but you're absolutely right. So let me move over to Jennifer. Much of your work as a scholar and a practitioner is focused geographically on Venezuela and thematically on political polarization. So have America, has American democracy promotion efforts contributed to polarization in key countries? And how, if so, how can we determine if democracy and human rights centered foreign policy mitigates or alleviates these challenges? Yeah, um, thanks Paige. You know, it's really a balance that um, we have to uh, work towards between promoting and defending uh, democratic and human rights and interfering to the point that it contributes to polarization in societies that is harming um, democracies. So I'll give you um, some examples over time in Venezuela and how the U.S. has learned and or some of the lessons that we can draw from that. That going back, uh, so for 20 years, the Hugo Chavez and his successor, Nicolas Maduro, 
had been in, in, in power in Venezuela. And in the early um, Bush years, in fact, George W. Bush years, starting in 2000, Hugo Chavez was kind of picking a fight with the United States um, and would hurl insults and you know be confrontational. And at the beginning, the Bush administration would respond um, in, in like kind. And, and that sort of helped or was part of the growing polarization, not only within Venezuela, but within the hemisphere. And the hemisphere started to split between those who supported Chavez and those who were opposed to Chavez, which hurt the democracy promotion, the democracy defense effort coming out of the Organization of American States, trying to implement the Inter-American um, uh, Democratic Charter. Um, but by the end of the Bush administration, certainly um, I think they had learned and had you know, stopped responding to those temptations of that Chavez, that, those provocations from Chavez. And in fact, the Bush administration was supporting mediation efforts, including by the Carter Center, to try to overcome the polarization. Then you can see kind of an, an opposite approach from Brazil, who was throughout most of the 2000s not engaged in um, pushing for human rights and democracy or trying to promote it. Instead, was was uh, reluctant to criticize anything happening in Venezuela, and so helped to enable some of those human rights abuses and uh, erosion of democracy. And then you see another swing coming up to more recently and with the current uh, times and with the Trump administration kind of jumping in, taking the lead um, where there was a Latin American coalition of countries in the last mm -hmm. four years, really trying to push on, on democracy and uh, to push the Maduro administration to uh, uh, relax its repression, um, but was not having a lot of success. So the Trump administration sort of jumped in and, and took the lead, particularly using pressure and sanctions. And the risk of that is that what happened was it, it didn't succeed in convincing the Maduro administration to end its repression. But what it did do was kind of give false hope to the opposition and divided the opposition itself, became polarized about how, what to do. And a good portion of the population in, in the opposition was waiting for the United States and others to come in and save them and was hoping for a military intervention. And so kind of stopped working themselves. So that's the risk. So I think with all of those different yeah. types of approaches, what we can learn from all of this is that one, it, we need to take a multilateral approach. We need to work with other countries, with international institutions in trying to promote and defend democracy and human rights. It doesn't work when we try it unilaterally or if we try only uh, sanctions or if we simply look away, N those are not good approaches. So working multilaterally, defending democratic principles, always defending them and speaking out for them and encouraging local action, local citizens, to try to, um, to work and press their own governments. And then the last thing is that I think we have to, particularly from the United States, avoid the temptation to preach to the rest of the world. Yeah. We often feel like we're the world's best democracy. And to others, it comes across as hypocritical and others see our flaws. And if we recognize our own flaws, we saw this a lot in election monitoring from the Carter Center. People would say, well, what about your own elections? You know, they're not so perfect. So. If we recognize our own flaws and recognize that democracy is always a work in progress, and um, I think that will help us, and and we we've, we've got to keep the moral high ground. And and as uh, Nicole's report pointed out so nicely, um, we we've got to keep defending democracy as a central point of our foreign policy, but also look at what we're doing at home at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the lessons learned is the biggest part of that. I think you know, I'm not going to walk into the buzzsaw of who has the best democracy, because I think we could take an entire event to have that discussion. But uh, to pull your point back to Nicole, you know, in the report, you mentioned that the American military engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan has been you know, falsely perceived to have, have been waged to promote or impose democracy. And the younger generations who are more familiar with the wars that longer American commitment to democracy and human rights promotion, you know, are, they're skeptical about democracy support as a concept. So can you speak to this and, and Nicole, let us know more about how we can overcome this type of skepticism? 
Sure, absolutely. Um, obviously, we just celebrated 9-11, and so for many of us, that was a, a life-changing day. If you are 30 or younger, you are 11 or younger on that day, and that means the entirety of your teens into your young adults and into now 30 um, were spent with the United States at war. I think we have allowed a narrative to develop around both the Afghanistan and the Iraq wars, which um, are not accurate and they don't help in uh, taking the right lessons from those two conflicts and ensuring that our foreign policy and national security policy are right sized. Both of those conflicts were waged because of security concerns, um, concerns about the Taliban, concerns about Saddam Hussein. Obviously, there are a lot of questions around the intelligence, around the Iraq war, but none of that, even in that, um, in that debate around the intelligence, nowhere was democracy the single reason why the United States went into military conflict in either of those countries. And yet that is a primary narrative that many people have drawn from it. And largely that's come because once the military conflict um, had reached its military goals, you had two countries in very different situations, but two countries that had somewhat of a political vacuum. And the United States chose to put into that political vacuum and support local leaders in building democracies, in large part because we recognize democracy to be the system that is most reflective of the will of the people. Democracy um, is struggling to say the least in both countries. And so what many people have then said is, the United States waged a war for democracy, democracy is not doing well, therefore democracy is not a great policy. And that's just a bit of a flawed log logic. And what we do need to say is really pick apart what are the right lessons learned? When do we use uh, force? as part of our national security and foreign policy. I do think that there is a right time to use it and a wrong time to use it. But ensuring that we also recognize that democracy support around the world is not what we do with the barrel of a gun. <laughs> we do it through organizations in partnership with organizations like Dan's um, and a number of other organizations that we support to do on the ground work to support other people to live into what their desires are for a freer society. And for young people, I think what we need to do is start telling that entire narrative accurately and also um, challenge them to think about um, the role of democracy in society. What we have with young people is a very passionate, very engaged um, group of people that are behind so much of the great civil um, and social movements we see now, but is to have them challenge that, channel that into um, constructive um, efforts through um, systemic change and to say democracy is really that system that will allow for that. Um, but we need to have that comprehensively and to really um, accurately reflect the important role that democracy plays at home and abroad. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and and we'll come back to sort of where military and not and NGOs can actually fit in. I'll come back to Dan, but uh, Professor Dr. Lavar Smith has joined us, and I uh, want to make sure he's got audio and everything's working. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me. Hello, everyone. I apologize for. Yeah, uh, you know, welcome to 2020. <laughs> I think we spent <laughs> our life apologizing for technical difficulties. So. I'm really happy you were able to join us. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Morehouse College. His research interest has been focused on political development, international political economy, and democratization, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Dr. Smith is a 2002 graduate of Morehouse, and he also has an MS degree from the Sam Nunn School at Georgia Tech and an MA and PhD and political science from Miami University. So welcome, LaVar, I'm glad you were able to, to finally kick in. And if you don't mind, I'm just gonna actually start, we've already done a round of questions, but let me ask you, because much of your work has focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. So how do you see the US foreign policy impacting democratic development on the continent right now? So first of all, I wanna thank you for um, just allow me to be a part of such a, a great panel um, at such a, a timely, uh, uh, such an important time in our uh, period, um, just globally because of COVID-19 um, and uh, around the world, just because of the necessity of democracy right now. Um, so first of all, I think that um, 
we're almost in what I would call Africa's third phase of democratic independence. Um, and I would um, definitely follow uh, Professor Tadaka's recommendations in the Choose Freedom Report that also highlight that while democracy may be in decline, um, according to Freedom House and other statistics at the government level, I think that democracy is still very alive and well in Africa. If we think about how society and citizens are still longing and clamoring for um, democracy in terms of political participation, uh, yeah. the exercising of free speech, freedom of expression, but also um, civil society. We have very robust and active civil societies um, on the continent of Africa. And I think that one of the things that we've also um, understood in these challenging times where democracy has kind of been um, affected universally um, and leaders have attempted to use COVID-19 as a, as a means of curtailing individual freedoms, um, we do see examples of civil society being very active. Um, we can think about um, Abiy Ahmed and, and Ethiopia and the Tingare people in, in, in Northern Ethiopia um, holding elections, um, even though he uh, postponed them as a result of COVID-19. Um, I think that where we stand in terms of looking at US foreign policy and democratic development on the continent, I think that it's important that the United States government kind of return to um, back to basics, so to speak, um, as they did in the democratization movements of the 1990s, where they were actively supportive of, of labor unions, um, student groups, civil society, uh, but most importantly, also engaged in constructive dialogue with um, governments, transitioning governments in Ghana, Nigeria, and South Africa about the shape of democracy. And I think that that's where um, our new foreign policy really needs to restructure itself. I think that over the past decade or so, there's been greater emphasis on security um, concerns throughout the continent, which then has made um, the United States, in terms of its foreign policy, um, strange bedfellows. If we think about um, Museveni in Ghana, I mean, excuse me, Museveni in Uganda, for example, um, it's made for strange bedfellows um, throughout the continent. So I think that that is um, maybe a ground, a grassroots ground up way of looking at democracy. And I, and I would definitely encourage that the U.S. foreign policy take another look at that. Um, Thanks, Lavar. I think you're absolutely right. I think you know in the space that that we all occupy, uh, and I'm going to throw this over to you, Dan. You know, as an American NGO, uh, I think NGOs have a role to play in promoting democracy and human rights overseas. And the Carter Center does this. IRI does this. So whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East or places where, where we fit in, it would be helpful if you can tell us a little bit more about how IRI does this work and what you see on the 10-year horizon for this, the big challenges we have ahead of us. As LeVar said, you know, the, the continent of Africa might be on its third wave. You know, this isn't always linear and we, don't, we can't track it across, but I'd be interested to know sort of your tenure crystal balling horizon. Oh dear, okay. Um, <laughs> mine may not be as good as yours, Paige, but I, maybe I could just start with Professor Smith's excellent comments. You know, I grew up in West Africa uh, at a time when uh, Freedom House in 1982, when I moved there, said there were two democracies in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. There are now several dozen, right? Uh, they don't all work perfectly, no democracy does. But his point is a very good starting point, which is that the demand for democratic reform out in the world is higher than ever. No, governments may not be meeting that demand. Governments may be underperforming. They may be disappointing their citizens. That's true in every country. But that does not mean that people do not want freedom and reform and opportunity and accountability and change, right? So we should distinguish uh, how democratic governments perform, which is uneven, with the fact that people all over the world, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but from Hong Kong to Belarus, to Venezuela, to Sudan, are demanding change from their leaders. And that democracy is very much a system. It is a bottom-up system that is fundamentally about citizens. It is not about leaders. And too often, democracy is judged by the leader uh, in this country as in any country. And in fact, we should think about civil society, citizen activism, free media, independent courts, effective institutions, that all of these things are what people all over the world are demanding. So uh, IRI and other groups uh, 
go out and don't try to project and impose anything, but we try to work with partners on the ground who want our help in affecting peaceful change to make their voices heard, uh, to, emp to help empower them to have a political voice. And that includes lots of underrepresented groups. Women are underrepresented in most countries in the world in positions of power. Uh, young people feel like they are often alienated or disenfranchised. So how do you empower them to engage in effective political life? Uh, how do you make sure that democracy is working for everyone and not just a set of cosseted elites at the top, right? I mean, those are themes that ring true all over the world. So we work with partners on the ground all over the world to help them navigate their work forward and find their voice and find their path. Over the next 10 years, you know, I would say the thing we perhaps worry about the most, it's not do people want democracy versus autocracy. Of course, people want democratic freedoms. Uh, we worry very much about the digital space, that actually China and Russia and other malign actors are trying to create a digital space that is fundamentally not free and open and liberal and tolerant, that is fundamentally oriented towards making the world safe for autocracy. This connects very much to American democracy. Russia in particular has been attacking American democracy. And so part of our mission, I think, is to protect our own democracy by going out into the world and helping people fighting for a more democratic future. You know, it's not Luxembourg or Belgium who are attacking us with disinformation and misinformation. It is foreign autocracies uh, that want to discredit our institutions, that want to polarize our publics, pit ourselves against each other so that they can make the world safe for autocracy and Americans should not stand for that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think the digital threats that we are facing uh, are prevalent for not just us, but for overseas. Um, so, and, and democracy in general. So uh, Jennifer, let me ask you, when it comes to supporting democracy and human rights, obviously the US doesn't have a spotless record. Uh, we certainly learned that this summer uh, as we've had our own reawakening in many cases. So how, is the US, how has the US tried to reconcile that with supporting democracy overseas? What's your assessment of the US record and how effective can we be? Well, um, I think our record on supporting democracy has varied a lot over the years. And it, it, in, to some degree that reflects what's happening within the United States too. So during the Cold War, we actually used a lot of covert um, interventions and it wasn't so much to support democracy, it was to try to uh, build up our, our alliance against the Soviet Union. So it was to prevent communism and Soviet influence. And so we ended up supporting a lot of dictators um, during that time, rather than democracy. And, uh, you know, we get then to the 1990s after the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union disbanded, and we had a very strong democracy promotion uh, record uh, during that period, really supporting civil society organizations, some of the stuff that LeVar was talking about, and uh, Nicole and Dan too, and um, private sector uh, growth but probably didn't spend enough time on sort of state capacity and institution um, building to make those democracies strong enough. And um, then in the 2000s, uh, we did end up with, you know, using force. And Nicole talked about this a bit, and I completely agree the Afghan intervention was for security reasons in response to Al Qaeda's terrorist attack. Um, but Iraq, uh, my reading is that kind of the theory of regime change and starting a domino effect of, of democracies in the region was a strong motiva motivation for intervention there um, with uh, rather disastrous results, actually. And so I think today what we've got to focus on is consistency. And again, it gets back to that question of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we continue to be inconsistent on the support of human rights and democracy abroad. So China for a long time has gotten a pass from the United States uh, on, on human right, its human rights abuses. Saudi Arabia has gotten a pass. Um, it's you know, said it's an important ally in the Middle East, obviously has been for uh, decades a supplier of oil to the US, but also an important arms buyer, arms sale customer. Um, today, Russia gets a pass, despite the intervention that Dan um, so aptly described. So uh, 
I think we've also got to be careful that some of our democracy promotion policies or what's called democracy promotion is motivated by our domestic politics. And for Latin America, the region I've studied, uh, domestic politics, the role of Florida as a swing state and also the home to a lot of Latinos has played an important uh, role. And so we mix our domestic priorities, particularly in, with regard to our uh, policies toward um, Latin America and uh, Cuba and Venezuela, um, I would say. Um, so whether it's arms sales, whether it's um, our trade or corporate interests, whether it's our domestic politics, I think we've got to be more um, cognizant of the need to, again, prioritize democracy and human rights and be consistent in our approach. Yeah, I, that's uh, excellent points. I, I think that our consistency or lack thereof really affects our ability to promote some of the policies and the, that, that we want to be talking about. But bringing it back home again, Nicole, let me ask you, you know, what can citizens do to help ensure that the U.S. maintains democracy and human rights as a pillar of foreign policy? Absolutely. Um, so there, are, I, I put them in two baskets. Um, first is citizens, you know, Dan was talking about democracy as a bottom-up movement. Citizens have, a, have um, an important voice to play in determining what foreign policy is by expressing that to um, at the ballot box, but in the course of any given year to elected members, whether they are in Congress or whether they are in the executive branch. And so civil individual citizens, but obviously citizens groups and um, faith-based groups and other business groups have a voice in this process that they have to be raising with our with our government that that makes decisions about what our foreign policy looks like. And, and we see that happening already. We see individual groups going to Congress or going to the executive mm -hmm branch to push for specific legislation or to push, push for a specific policy, but we need that type of advocacy on behalf of democracy as a whole. So that would be the first basket, which is citizens exercising their voice in the process of the foreign policy of foreign policy shaping. But second is the United States also acts as an example around the world. And I recognize um, for better or for worse that we do. And, there, and, and we are seeing now when the United States is awakening to what have been our shortcomings, significant shortcomings in our own country, what impact that has in other countries, but also it has an impact that it allows us to show other countries, how do you deal with shortcomings within a democracy? You deal with it with more democracy. You deal with it with people going to the street and raising their voices and showing that that is what democracy looks like. People taking to the streets, expressing where there are shortcomings and asking for change in public policy, asking for change in our, in our, in our institutions. So the first basket is how people can engage in the foreign policy process. So the second is how can we be examples for the rest of the world to speak humbly but confidently about democracy in our own country, but ensure that we are pushing our domestic institutions to be fully just, to be fully equal for all people, to look at those laws and those practices where we are still falling short of the democratic ideals upon which our country was founded and continuing to push to get to that um, that level of stronger democracy. And the more we do that at home, the more of an example we can set for others in the world. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. I, being in Europe and trying to promote democracy and it was a difficult thing to do for the last few years for me, but this actually, actually in LeVar, I'm gonna bring this back to you. You know, in your experience, how can organizations like the Carter Center, IRI and the Bush Institute and scholars like Jennifer and yourself help to engage young people in discussions about democracy, human rights, and the world. You know, we talk about, you know, voting and being on the streets and, you know, and, and having your voice heard. But, you know, I'd be interested to know how you think organizations like us can work this more effectively. So I think that realistically, I think that there's, um, I think that organizations like NDI, IRI, um, the Bush Institute, Carter Center do an amazing job in terms of raising public awareness about freedom around the world, about human rights, mm -hmm. and about democracy. But to Professor Sadaka's point, I think that the conversations need to be had earlier um, in terms of civic engagement. And what I mean by that is, you know, I learned about the Carter Center as a college student. 
right? Mm -hmm. So I think that most of that institutional learning about what democracy is, how it functions, not just here in the United States, but also around the world, um, and engaging in a real constructive dialogue about democracy has to begin even sooner. I'm thinking K through 12 education, where we actually start to really um, teach our students about the importance of democracy, what it stands for, um, not only in this country, how to advocate for rights, but then also how it uh, reverberates around the world. Um, there was an article that I just get, um, gave to my students in Comparative Politics by David Rukari um, called African Lives Matter. And there's similarities between the two, but in, in the most important facet of it is that our students learn, right, that um, the use of force um, in any state against citizens without this presence of justice, right, then undermines democratic, undermines democracy and democratic reform. So I think that um, in many ways, one of the things that we can do is start to educate our, our um, students, but most importantly, the broader population on the meanings of, of democracy and its relevance, not only in the United States, but also as we project it around the world. Um, and I think that our organizations need to do that a lot sooner. Um, in terms of doing that deep um, advocacy work. Um, I think that this uh, panel is also enlightening because um, as a professor, I've been able to teach um, uh, Jennifer's work on um, the powerlessness of elections in Latin America, one of the book chapters she wrote on democracy to my students. So one of the things that we learn from this millennial generation, especially if we think about what's going on in the United States, but also in Africa, is that they want to see change in real time. So being able to connect scholars to one another, but also to organizations like the Carter Center, IRR, and the Bush Institute, then allow our students to actually see that they are also part of the levers of change. And that is not just a set of theories written by scholars in the ivory tower, but we're also actively engaged. Um, the last point I think that is very vital is that in many ways, one of the things that we fail to do in terms of connecting young people to the continent is to engage in more exchanges. Um, and I think that this is important, bolstering programs like, like Boren, Fulbright, um, the Wrangle and Pickering uh, fellowships that allow um, minority students to actually be a part of USAID and the Foreign Service. These things are also vital, but also the United States has a rich, vibrant um, community of immigrants from around the world. And fostering those connections with them um, to actually then promote democracy in the in the countries of origin um, is also a way that we can see fundamental change. And I'm thinking um, in particular about the Gambian example in 2017, where that pro-democracy movement was primarily pushed by expats um, living in places like Ohio and Texas, right? So again, this. Um, interesting dialogue between members of the Gambia diaspora, not just here in the United States, but also um, in the UK about how they wanted to actually change, right? Um, change society, push for democracy, and then lead um, to the removal of Yaya Jimmy. So I think that there's um, a multifaceted approach that we can take to it. One more comment that I'd like to make very briefly um, about US foreign policy as well. I think that the United States has also um, failed to engage um, business, um, young entrepreneurs, um, members of um, civil society, if we think about our um, Africa's young um, leaders, I think that the, um, the Yali project um, initiated under President Obama has done a great job of bringing young leaders to the United States, um, but also um, there needs to be more emphasis on economic development and something that was initiated under Reagan, which is constructive engagement. Um, again, I think because of China's policies in places like Africa and its um, policy of non-interference, we're gradually losing this war of economic development where the United States has primarily been stronger. So I think that um, also um, creating spaces for the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which has been extended to 2025, to actually gain a foothold among American businesses and American entrepreneurs to then build a greater relationship between the continent and the U.S. So, yeah, no, I know no, that was a lot. I know it, it was a lot, but you've touched on a lot of important pieces. And I think, uh, you know, with the challenges we have with COVID, we also have this opportunity. And you're talking about bringing this to sort of civic education. You know, a lot is being done online now, and there are a lot of virtual sort of 
ability for people to learn a little bit more than they had when they were showing up at class every day. There's obviously also our dining room tables as we find ourselves with millennials back home. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. When you have these conversations and they're much deeper and more grounded in the reality of what's happening now. But you're right on exchanges. I, I worked with an exchange organization that actually runs Yali, and I can tell you that that's a huge difference in whether it's it's a, a group like IREX or Aspen Institute or anyone who has these exchanges. That really helps open people's eyes. So I think you're right. It needs to start earlier than, uh, as Nicole was saying, we, it's here and now, but we also need to have it start earlier. So Dan, let me throw this over to you. Uh, so Jimmy Carter said that the best way to enhance freedom in other lands is to demonstrate here that our democratic system is worthy of emulation. But I actually want to ask you the converse of that. In your work with IRI, are there actually elections, democracy, or human rights lessons from overseas that you think might be interesting or useful in the context of the United States? Sure. I mean, I think we should remember that we have a constitutional system that was designed to prevent tyranny, right? It wasn't designed to be uh, uh, the Lamborghini of government efficiency. Uh, it was constructed at a time when there were literally no democracies in the world. And the founders tried to create a system of checks and balances and citizen and institutional oversight to prevent tyranny. So, uh, you know, the good thing about democracy is that it is self-correcting, it is resilient, and it is the only system that opens avenues for citizens to effectively uh, push change, right? That does not happen in an autonomy. I mean, the reason that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Belarus are because there is literally no vehicle for citizens. I mean, they had a fake election where the winner was not honored. The guy who got 20% of the vote said he got 80% of the vote. Uh, American democracy, other democracies, there are lots of channels for positive and constructive change. And that citizen activism is what makes our democracy strong and better. Uh, and then obviously channeled through uh, effective institutions. So uh, I think the takeaway for me, just we work in almost 100 countries around the world, is that democracy looks different in different places. It's not as if there's an American model, um, that every democracy is unique. Uh, it is, you know, its origin story is a little bit different. Uh, the legacy, cultural, historical, colonial others are always different. But in fact, there are common, uh, there are common uh, elements that we should continue to invest in. Uh, and one is those checks and balances, having a strong parliament or a strong Congress that can oversee an executive to make sure that executive does not get overweening. Uh, there is uh, obviously regular free and fair elections. Uh, there are uh, obviously uh, free media, active civil society. I mean, all those things that we know, you know, they're not particularly American. We see these all over the world. But democracy is not, we should remember, it's not the natural instinct of humankind. I mean, for most of human history, people lived under various awful forms of tyranny. So democracy is this dream that we are trying to uh, protect, secure, advance every day. And it's hard, not easy. And we will never be done. It's not as if, you know, our children will be able to relax because Paige and Nicole and colleagues will do all the work and then we'll, we'll be done. It's never going to be done. Right. So we should keep that in mind. The last thing I would say, Paige, um, just because I think it's an important point, and I think I originally got this insight from Nicole and all her teaching of young people, is that not every, uh, not every young person is animated by democracy the way maybe some of us are. They may be animated by uh, issues of social and racial justice or by wanting to tackle the climate crisis uh, or by issues of inequality. Whatever motivates you democracy is the way that you're going to affect change as a citizen you're not going to do it if you don't have those representative accountable institutions and you don't have those peaceful avenues for citizen engagement so you got to care about democracy so that what you really care about can be advanced uh, under your leadership and activism and then fundamentally i think that's the most important point of democracy is that citizens guide the way yeah yeah no, i i, I you're absolutely right. And I think, as you said, democracy looks different in different places. And, you know, I think it's been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other forms that have been tried from time to time. So we don't know that this is, in fact, 
going to be a one size fits all. And so the work that is being done is really important that we shed a light and make, you know, open the aperture for all these discussions to happen. Um, so Jennifer, this actually leads me to you, you know, one set of recommendations that's in Nicole's report focuses on engaging the public in foreign policy issues during the 2020 election campaign. As we talk about democracy and the important of it, import, importance of it, we look at the upcoming election and say, so really, if, if we could write one question to pose the candidates for one of the debates this year related to foreign policy, what would the question be and why? Um, all right, I would ask, I wrote down this question. Do you agree that the well-being of the United States is bound up with the rest of the world? If so, what will be your priority? Uh, which global problem to work together to resolve would you start with? And if you don't agree, how do you think the U.S. can solve problems like the pandemic or environmental degradation or drug trafficking alone? And the reason I would talk about that is because I think that um, what we've been talking about here too is, is to talk about students and youth and American citizens in general, the need to, to look abroad, to realize that our fate is bound up with the rest of the world. And if we start thinking we can do anything alone, um, live alone, solve these big global problems alone, then we are misleading ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And so uh, I, would, I would ask that to focus the attention on that. And I, I just want to re, um, kind of confirm what Dan just had said, that for all of these problems that are concerning to us, and whichever one it is that's concerning to you, like climate change or the pandemic and public health and all of this stuff, that, yeah, the way to solve it is through democracy. And so we have got to keep uh, supporting that. And it's so important for the United States to have this moral leadership um, for it to, to, you know, kind of live by example and to keep focusing on fixing ourselves. That's why I keep coming back to this hypocrisy, avoid hypocrisy. But that's what, that's the question I would ask the candidates. Well, let's hope there's an anchor person listening, or maybe we can try to slide that candle, that, that question in, because I think it's a, a good one. So let me do a round robin to each of our panelists. Uh, and Nicole, I'll start with you. So if there's one thing that you hope people listening to today take away from this conversation, what would it be? Great question. Um, the United States has a very important role in serving both its own interests and the interests of the world by supporting people at home and abroad who actively want the same justice and the same freedom that we have um, enjoyed in many ways in the United States. And that an active, responsible, engaged United States that is an example at home and an active participant in the world um, will make us stronger at home and stronger globally. That's great. Great, Dan, let me slide to you. So I, I just think this is a lesson of history. Uh, American democracy is not secure in a world where autocracy is on the march, that we cannot simply bury our heads in the sand and uh, focus on only our country, that actually our future of freedom is tied to the fate of freedom in the world and that the security and prosperity that we enjoy is a function of a stable and peaceful and free world. And to the extent that that degrades out in the world, it will come back to bite us here at home. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, LeVar. Yeah, um, I, I also, um, I, I, I... whoops. Oh, I think we've lost you, LeVar. All right, Jennifer, let me slide over to you. I would say pay attention um, and uh, don't give up hope but push our own leaders, hold our own leaders accountable um, at all levels to promote our, uh, our, our principles and to, to continue to privilege our principles of hu human rights and democracy. And then 
push for that to enter our foreign policy, for those principles to, um, to be highlighted in our foreign policy for the sake, not only of us, but for the rest of the world. But to remember, it's going to benefit us as well. Yeah, I, it, it's, um, it is such a precarious time that we're in right now, because as we talk, you know, as we look at what we have in front of us, and, and I'll say when I came in back to the U.S. On, on June 1st, I flew into Atlanta and the CDC was waiting at the airport to ask me if I had been to Iran or China, as if somehow the numbers there for COVID were worse than they were here in Georgia. You know, I drove down Peachtree Street and I saw the the uh, remainder of what had happened after George Floyd and the protests that we had. And I walked in and I saw a split TV screen with you know, my other hometown of Washington, D.C. and tear gassing happening uh, with peaceful protesters. So as we look at examining ourselves and examining where we think the importance of human rights and democracy are within our own society. I think it's such an important, you all made excellent po points about the checks and balances that we have in checking ourselves, especially before people like Dan and I go overseas and try to have these conversations. It's, uh, it's important that we're able to look in the mirror. And I think you all have done an excellent job today talking specifically about the importance of how democracy looks in the US, how it looks abroad, where it fits into our foreign policy, and where it needs to continue to fit into our foreign policy. And Nicole, your your paper, I mean, I, I think that it really, you touched on so many important parts and I wanna give you sort of the final words on, on, on the paper and sort of the takeaway because a lot of work went into that. And I actually was part of a group that was online before you were supposed to be online to actually review your paper back in, you know, back in the fall. Um, when everyone else was meeting, I was trying to join from Europe to at least give uh, my comments. But uh, let me end it with you. you. You wrote the report and you outlined some of the main recommendations when we started. But if you want to have closing remarks here, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I thank you for that. And thank you for your participation and many others into the report. I feel like it was a team project. Um, I think the most important thing is that it's a call to action. It's not a report that we put on the shelf. It is a call to action, which is a reminder that democracy is a living process and that we own it as citizens of a particular country. And if we have a problem with it, we have the opportunity to engage. We are in an election year. We um, have the opportunity not only to vote on November 3rd, but certainly to participate by raising our voices. We all have communities of influence, whether that is our family or our faith group or our business or our civic groups. We have the opportunity to raise questions about how can we strengthen American democracy? Who are the leaders who are gonna lead us in that direction? And what can we individually do to ensure that how we show up in our spheres of influence, in our online presence of influence, that we are constantly reinforcing and pushing for stronger democracy, stronger institutions and respect for values. Um, and that at the end of the day, the report is there to call people to action, to take charge of what is in their hands. Well, great, thank you. I wanna thank all of our panelists for a really fruitful and interesting discussion this morning. Uh, we plan to continue the conversation and the discussion thread on, form, uh, on human rights. And we hope you'll join there as well as we try to offer a solution to some of these issues. So please join us for future roundtables at the Forum for Human Rights. Uh, you can find out more at forum.cartercenter.org uh, backslash roundtables. So if you're a student, you've RSVP'd for the closed student Q&A to start at 105, please join us on Zoom via the link you will have received by email. And we look forward to continuing the conversations with you at the Forum. Uh, thank you, Nicole, Jennifer, Dan, and sadly, I think we lost LeVar, but thank you all for joining us today and being part of this important topic. Thank you, Paige. Great to be with you. Thank you, Paige.